my name is uh, Shahin Shadlu, uh, engineering manager at RPS Composites. I have been with RPS about two years, and uh, we make straight FRP pipes, tanks, and dual laminate pipes and tanks. And uh, one of the dual laminate uh, RTP1 certified uh, shops in um, in Canada. So today I want to talk about how to best manage a project or procurement project. So everything you're looking for basically is to have a successful project is lower the cost, shorten the amount of delivery time and have a high quality product. And today I want to talk about the manufacturer's perspective, uh, how we uh, can help you or how basically can help us help you to run the project smoother. So the first slide I know that Daryl talked about it uh, before, and uh, it's odd coming from a vendor to tell you how to qualify a vendor. But uh, so basically what we, uh, you know, when you want to have a list of qualified vendor, this is what you want to look for. Uh, recommendation and reputation. You want to look at their experience, how long they've been around. Uh, certificates. Uh, documentation so this is a big one because the vendors can claim everything right they can say we comply with this standard you know all of our products are based on that so we have these test results so it's important that you always ask for the document that to show you that so for instance if they have uh, if they say we're using a certain mechanical properties ask for the test results if they say we comply with a certain standard ask for a design report showing the compliance uh, for the quality, whatever system, internal system it, it, they have in place, they should have documentation. So that's probably one of the best tool you can uh, uh, gauge the vendor. Uh, the, the other one is variety of services. So if you need different services, for instance, you need pipes, tanks, you need build insulation, you need training. Uh, if you go to one vendor, it's, it's usually uh, helps you to have a smoother project because all the communication being done within the company, so you're not like the middleman going back and forth. And also, um, at the end, you have a warranty on everything. So if something goes wrong, there's just one vendor responsible. So request for quotes. And uh, I know in the design session, we chatted about these specs. And uh, today, I want to talk about our perspective of the specs. And let's start with the general spec. So first of all, I think general spec, have, having one spec is very important. This is the best tool that you can communicate with us what you need and what you want. Uh, the other thing is, if you don't have internal uh, SMEs on FRP, please get support and get help to develop your spec. That's very important. Uh, the other thing is, for the spec, uh, it would be best if it's lean and contains all the information. So basically, you need to include all your all of your needs, but in a, you know the small uh, version, you know, as possible. Um, the other thing is sometimes we get specs that are from two thousand and eight, two thousand and ten. So just going through that, there is a lot of items in there that are not valid anymore. You know, the new standards they just uh, they're, they're different. So it's important that you, if you have a spec that is, I'd say, older than two, three years, it's to just open it up, have a look at it, and update it. The things that you can update is uh, the latest revision of the standards. Sometimes they disagree with your previous requirements, so it's important to update those. Uh, the lessons learned from each project. So if you have a project with a vendor, something goes wrong, and say, if we had this term in the spec, you know, it would have covered us. So it's important that you just, just include that in your spec. Uh, if you have uh, a term that, you know, 15 out of 20 vendors take exception to it and you're good, you, you agree with that, maybe consider removing it or make it optional, something like that. And again, if you have some statement or a section that confuses all the vendors, everyone coming back, ask for clarification, uh, it would be great if you can just uh, opt it and clarify those. Uh, common issues in the specs. <clears throat> so uh, when you put the spec together, please uh, think about the vendor that they have to go through every line or at least a 
reputable vendor. They want to go through every single line, make sure what you need, and uh, you know, make the product that way. So sometimes we get a spec and say, comply with RTP1, that's good. And then we get pages and pages of material copied from RTP1 in that spec. So uh, if you have a more strict requirement, that's okay. You can just bring it and say, yeah, RTP1 asked for this, but I need this. Uh, or if there are a couple of points that even though they're in RTP1, it's really important to you, you want to include it, that's, that's also fine. But again, if you have several sections just copied and pasted, uh, please consider removing those. That would just help to, to reduce the length of the spec. Uh, the other common issue that we see, and the, it, this is usually come up when a non-expert develops the spec, is they just Google FRP and PI standards codes, and whatever lease shows up, they put it, just comply with all of these. See European standards in there. You see Asian standards, North American standards. So uh, again, if you have that, uh, you know, it's again important to get support and see what standard is more most applicable, most suitable for your case, and uh, reduce it to those. Uh, uh, the other aspect is um, so when you come to us and ask for a custom made product, something that is not off the shelf, not uh, something we have ready, and then you include some requirement for some standards like 2992 that requires long-term testing, nine-month testing, a year testing. It's just uh, not feasible for a custom-made product to be tested for a year and then delivered to you. So again, if you have that, uh, you can switch to the standards that require short-term testing. Uh, the other thing, this is a cost uh, basically adder. Uh, there are a requirement that they belong to the job specific spec, not the generic spec, but they're in there. For instance, they say PSA is required, or they say uh, some expensive testing, uh, either for the properties or during the fabrication is required. So we normally, when we see those, we either add it in the code as a separate line. So you see, this is gonna cost you this much to do all those testing, or we simply take exception and just say, if you really need those testing, let us know and we code, code you separately. But some vendors may just, just do that. They just add that cost in the code. So you see a high number, you don't really know why it's so expensive, but they assume that you really need all these, uh, all these inputs. Technical inputs or the job specific spec, basically we have the other type of issues. So with the generic spec, we always complain because it's just too long unnecessarily. For the job specific aspect or the information, we usually have missing information. We're looking for something that is not there. So a good practice is uh, if you order a lot of pipes, tanks, or any type of documents, it's good to have a checklist. Uh, you have a template. I know some of you, they already, you already have. But uh, in that way, you know there's a placeholder, and you, you simply don't miss it. You knew you have to put an input in there. Uh, if you look for a starting point, you can send me an email and I'll point you to the checklist that we have on our website that you can use as starting points to know what type of information to include. Um, the other thing that is important, so when you're replacing an equipment, when you're replacing pipes and tanks, and uh, it could be a failure happen, it could be it's just old, you want to replace it. Um, some customers, they do a study of their own. They investigate. They just look at the history of that equipment. If there's a failure, usually it's, it's more common. They hire some company and they look into it. Uh, so if you do that, that's fine. If you didn't do it, uh, it really helps if you include some information about the previous you know, uh, equipment. So the reason for replacing uh, the age of the old equipment. Uh, the maintenance history, if you have constant issue with one aspect of it. Um, and information on the failure, if you had any failure, and also the material use. So when we have that information, uh, it helps us to, for the next rev, for the, for the new one, we do some improvement and basically yeah, provide you with a better product. Uh, the other thing is, this is very simple. Uh, sometimes, let's say we get an old drawing for a tank, but you don't want it exactly that way. You want to move a nozzle. You want to increase the size of manway or something. And sometimes we just get a description in the email and that's fine. We'll figure it out. 
but just to reduce any chance of you know formation missing, I mean, missing it's uh, it would be good practice if you mark up your old drawing it could be just handwritten and uh, include that common missing information on tanks this is probably the number one if the tank is sitting in a containment and the bottom of the tank basically the concrete pad that you have the height is not taller than the wall of the containment please let the vendor know so basically if the tank is exposed to flooding we need to know to design the hold down system for flooding condition uh, the bottom of the tank and the shell could be designed or not for flooding condition that's your choice but either way you need to let the vendor know because per rtp1 if you decide to take that risk and not to design the tank bottom for flooding condition we have to put a label on the tank that says this tank is not designed for this condition. If a flooding event happens, the tank needs to be inspected before it goes back to the service. Um, so for seismic wind snow information, usually we just get a installation address and that's fine. We can figure out some information like acceleration, wind speed from that, but there are information that are job specific and they're most of the time they're just missing like side class, exposure factors, importance factors. Uh, the tank base height from the ground so we need that information from you to be able to uh, design the tank if it's a tower if you have internals we need the dry and wet weight of those internals if you have a uh, packing support we need the weight of the support so whatever we are not supplying we need to have the information and also uh, i know we talked about the nozzle loads a lot so obviously it's recommended that you don't add you, you know you prevent loading the tank nozzles as much as possible uh, in you know uh, by supporting the valves independently doing a proper pipe analysis using expansion joints and all those stuff but we've seen cases that you know some nozzles they have to take some load you have no choice and it's best that if you let us right before the design stage because that it has implications on the shell thickness on the repad adding gusset the nozzle itself so this is something we need to know up front and also, if you have a mixer, please let us know if the tank needs to take the weight, if it's supported independently, and we need to know the power of the mixer. On the pipe side, probably solids is the most type of missing information. So we, we receive a request and says, I have solids. And uh, for us to be able to give you the best type of abrasion resistant liner, we need to have more information. What is the type? What is the size? of the solids that you have in there, uh, the concentration and all the stuff. And most of the customers, they don't have that information. And this is where having that historical information that I just talked about comes in handy. Uh, so customers coming up, coming to us say, do you have abrasion resistant pipe? And we could have simply say, yes, this is like our pre-injured product, but we normally start digging. What's the problem? Say, yeah, I have this pipe that failed after three weeks being in service. So right off the bat, we know if a regular pipe failed after three weeks, an abrasion resistant pipe, a, a regular one might give you three months, but not the 20 years you're expecting. So it's, uh, it's very important, again, to, to share with us that historical information. Uh, and also, please let us know the, you know the list of chemicals with the components. I know that uh, a lot of the times, you specify the resin system and that's fine we comply but we normally most of the time we do our due diligence if you have the list of chemicals we check the comply uh, the you know the uh, resistance for you the chemical resistance suitability for the temperature and you'd be surprised maybe more than 30 40 percent of the times we actually have a comment so we say this resin you know, maybe your borderline, maybe just, just too close to the capacity of the resin, we just recommend just upgrade one level, or it, it simply just doesn't work with that chemical. Um, on the pipe system analysis side, having the, again, I know uh, a lot was discussed, so description of the terminal points, operating uh, offset conditions and operating conditions. Uh, if you have insulation heat tracing, we need the weight and uh, we need the weight of the inline components. 
So the, as a final one, I just chatted with our estimators on the tank side, pipe side. I say, I'm going to talk to some of our customers. What would you, what's, what's, what's going to be your message? And probably the, the two most important one is please give us all the information we need and no more than that. So, um, um, you can imagine, you know, when we get a package, it includes 30 documents and total like 800 pages. And the total value of the product is $50,000. Uh, so if, if the estimator is busy and they have to select, like I have 20 RFQs, I only have capacity maybe for two, uh, they're just gonna respectfully decline the one with 800 pages of documents. So uh, sometimes we get document on, you know, it's just, a, small spool we get document on your electrical requirement there is no field installation we get document on health and safety on your site uh, so uh, please be a little bit more diligent when you send out an rfq again we want certainly to know all of your requirements but no more than that so when we get to the po purchase order probably the, the biggest point i want to make is having a kickoff meeting so if your vendor doesn't automatically set up a kickoff meeting after PO, uh, I recommend that you request it or you just set it up. And uh, it's very important that you include all the parties. So if the vendor is not doing the installation, if there are other, let's say, part uh, fabricator, if the internals being done by other vendors and everything, it's important that you include the key people from all parties uh, and and go through different points, go through the code spec requirement, let everyone ask their question, and you'd be surprised what type of potential issues will be caught in that meeting. That could be efficient, that could, that could save you a lot of time and money. Just, just having those people on the say, oh, you're going it this way? It just doesn't work because we, we figured, you know, this is how we're going to do it. And, and that could be like, that sentence could be like $50,000 and a month of delay. Just, just as easy as that. So when it gets to engineering, something we need from customer is just to keep the line of communication open. When we go through it, again, we, we have some information that is missing. Sometimes something doesn't work. We have to change your drawing. And obviously, we need to consult with you before we go through that. And uh, when it gets to the review, uh, uh, please uh, make resources available to complete that review in a timely manner. Um, when, when you do your review and if, you know, uh, your question or comments is more than maybe few simple, yeah, like this nozzle location should be two inch higher or something that can be easily figured out. Or if there's something you don't understand, again, setting up a meeting is the most effective way of communicating because sometimes in half an hour of the meeting, you can achieve what you could have achieved in 10 days of communication through 15 emails. Uh, the other thing to consider is um, if a pipe system analysis is being done uh, as a result of that, there could be changes to the components, could be reinforced elbows, there could be supports moving. So uh, before PSA is complete, basically you don't have a final design. Uh, so I included this because one day our CEO walked in my office and said, hey, Shine, I have a question for you. So sure. Say we tell our customers the engineering take six to eight weeks for a tank. Just in simple word, explain to me how design of a tank can take six to eight weeks. And, and then I just, you know, break it down for him. So obviously we have ongoing jobs. It's not like we're just sitting around waiting for job, one job to come in, you know, and there is like tank has 40 pages, 50 pages of calculation. You know, we have to ask question or whatnot. And, and there is customer review uh, and just, you know, out of my, because I knew that takes a long time, but just for myself and for his sake, I just draw a graph. I wish I'd include it here uh, for the ongoing projects, nine, 10 ongoing projects to show the time that we were responsible to do something versus the time we were waiting for some sort of inputs. You know, answering a question, reviewing something, and you'd be surprised to see, uh, you know, all that graph, like the red portion of it was the time we were waiting and it was like red all over the place. Um, so this is bad for us and obviously for you because you want your product to be delivered on time. 
and uh, basically 60% of the tanks uh, being affected, you know, the delivery time being affected just because the review stage. So for the fabrication, uh, so when we go there, we are hoping that we have a final drawing. So uh, if you think something could be changed, please let us know. So we hold at least that portion of the fabrication. Uh, as much as we need an approved drawing, we need to have an approved ITP. So we, everyone's on the same page on the you know, inspections, the hold points and everything. Uh, and also, um, uh, you know, please let us enough time to fabricate the tank. That, that's always the most cost effective solution if you have sufficient time. As far as delivery goes, include that in your schedule because sometimes, again, the impression is, okay, the tank was designed, the tank was built, that's good, I'm done. Uh, so delivery could take up to two weeks. Sometimes we have road closures, especially for those larger components that they require special permits, just takes a few days to get that permit. Uh, the, just the communication with the company who's doing the, the shipping, you know, in terms of how it's being supported, you know, how it's being packaged, the dimensions and all those things. So it's important that we start early. Uh, if you're dealing with a dual laminate product and well, we're based out of Canada, so if it's winter, uh, we need to put a heater inside the tank uh, j just to keep it warm so prevent cracking of the thermoplastic liner. So keep that in mind. If you have the option somehow to make the delivery happen in the summer or the warmer weather, that's obviously uh, better. Uh, if, you, you, if you're using your own tracking company, uh, if they have experience handling FRP equipment, that's fine. Just start the communication ahead of the time. Again, they need information from us. We need information from there. Uh, but uh, if it's just a cost saving thing, if they, if they don't have any experience, just be cautious because uh, obviously we have our own truck, not our own trucking company, but the company that we work with. So they're familiar how to handle our products. Uh, but again, that's very important for that last step. You don't want a defective product on your side because you just saved ten thousand dollar. Now you have to spend fifty to repair it on site. Now I want to talk about the schedule of the project. So I, I try to, you know, for people that they have probably a little bit less experience with FRP, I just wanted to give you some ideas on typically how long everything will take. Uh, please note that this, these are just generic numbers. Don't hold us up to it because if you're like, we have a lot of ongoing projects, which is actually the case, uh, these might be affected. But these are for a you know more uh, normal time. So for coding, again, sometimes we get, you know, one of those packages, the 800 packages, we get the request on Wednesday, and at the bottom of the email say, is it possible to get a code on Friday? Uh, so um, depending on size of your project, give us enough time. Again, if you are in rush, you know we're, we're just human. We have to have physically we need to have time to read through specs. We need to understand. We need to design. We need to estimate. We need to cool. We have to go through all those stages. If you are really pushed, we have two options: either to to decline to quote, or just to be conservative. We can't afford. To, to lose money. So when you're rushing us, you're not doing yourself a favor. Please be, unless it's like some, some you know, com, uh, uh, tank or something fail on your tank and you need it ASAP, that's understandable. But otherwise, please start these, these process ahead of time. Um, for the tank, uh, so I have tank column, I have pipe. On the left side of each, I have like a simple, more normal one. On the right-hand side, I have larger, more complicated projects. Um, for the tanks, one or two weeks for simpler one, it could take up to eight weeks for if you have like a tower with, with tall tower with uh, internals and, and a lot of, you know, details, give us more time. Uh, for the PO, that's a big one. Don't assume sometimes in the project scheduling, they just put a PO as a one day thing, like as a milestone. That's not a milestone. When we get a PO, there are terms and conditions. And sometimes those discussions could be lengthy back and forth, back and forth. We don't agree. You don't agree. So it could take some time. Um, uh, for the engineering, again, uh, even though if someone just focuses on the design, you don't give them any other tasks, they could have done it in, in a week or two, but we still allocate like six weeks. And the reason for that is 
oh, you know, everything that I told you about. We have ongoing jobs. We have questions. I, I know you're busy. When you send something for review, you can just jump on it. So you need some time. Uh, so consider enough time for engineering. Um, so fabrication, obviously, that depends a, a lot on what you're asking for. Sometimes just the buyout takes two months. You need some specific uh, grade of polypropylene that has to come from Europe. So it just takes two months to get it. Uh, and, uh, and finally, delivery. So two weeks is reasonable, but if you need all sort of special permits, if it's large, please consider more. Uh, so I decided to include this because we get a lot of requests um, that I need something yesterday. They just, we just get a call, say, uh, you know, I don't care how you make it. I, I just want it ASAP. And I thought, okay, let's include some hints that to help you if you're really in a rush, uh, how to shorten the amount of time. Um, so just look at the vendors. Uh, pre-engineered products. I know everyone has their, their own spec, they love it, they have their own requirement, but if you literally just need some pipe, just ask your vendor. And here's the thing, no reputable vendor will sell you something just for the sake of money if they either know it's not going to work for your system or they're not sure. The last thing we want is that our product fail on your site. We don't care how much money we make out of it. So when you specify, this is my pressure, this is my temperature, this is my chemical service. And when we tell you, I think this pre-engineered product, this off-the-shelf product work for you, it, it means at a time with the knowledge that we have, your confidence is gonna work for you. So you can consider that. Um, the other thing is please uh, communicate with us all your goals and the status of the project truthfully. So, um, if you have a certain delivery time or a shutdown time, don't give us like a month ahead of it. Just give us the exact date. Again, no reputable company. When, when we know you have a shutdown date, you know, we're not just gonna miss it. Say, oh, one week delay is not a big deal. We understand you need it that day, but it's important again to have realistic number, realistic dates and information. Um, if you don't have the inputs available, please let us know. Uh, we, we had a case last year that uh, uh, so last year for the pipe, you know, if, if you're trying to buy a pipe, you know, it was bad. Like uh, all the shops were um, at full capacity, just making pipes. And uh, a company approached us and said, uh, I need uh, like this many miles of pipe uh, by this date. So we look at everything and say, I have the drawing ready for you March 1st. I said, okay, awesome. We uh, accepted that. We just you know, looked at different aspects over time and I said, okay, we, we were able to make it. And coming March 1st, they issued the PO, but they said, oh, sorry, our engineer is taking a little bit longer and it's going to be a month delay. And after that, we don't, we're not going to have all the drawing. We're going to gradually give you some drawings. So what happens here, they think by issuing the PO, they're just booking capacity, they're safe, but uh, it's not, it's not going to happen because uh, obviously, when we don't have the information, we are already a month, you know, back from the schedule. And obviously, we're not just going to wait a month idle uh, for the drawing. So we have to pull another project ahead of you. And when we do that, uh, we have to finish it. So that's going to cause even further delay to your project. But if we knew already, if it's going to be end of March, we could have said, yes, yeah, sorry, no. But if we would have said yes, we just plan, you know, that way accordingly. So please be, uh, you know, just give us realistic dates as far as when the inputs will be ready or drawings. Uh, the, the other thing is you can consider uh, releasing some, you know, long lead items ahead of time. So if they're, again, procurements uh, to be done, uh, it's important to have that list ahead of time so we can do the procurement. Um, so one other thing is, so if you're dealing with a tank, something can be done before engineering is complete. For instance, if you don't have a special nozzle loading, we can start fabricating nozzles. If it's a dual laminate tank, we can start welding the liner because that doesn't depend on, this, uh, on the design. As far as you're confident, the size of nozzle is not going to change. The diameter of the tank is not going to change. The height of the tank is not going to change. We can start working on those. 
if it's a pipe, even though we don't really like to start any fab before PSA is done, but a straight piece of pipe, we consider them low risk. So if you're really in rush, you can absorb some potential cost down the road. Uh, it's safe to start fabrication a straight piece of pipe before PSA is complete. With some obviously rough estimating and uh, you know en rough estimate engineering beforehand. Um, the other thing is don't uh, you know when you're in rush when you issue the PO and a vendor agrees to do the job for you don't just issue the PO and go radio silence on us. Uh, we still need information from you, so it's really important that on your end you need to make resources available. Uh, you know, the same way that we make resources available to move the project along. Um, the other item is how to reduce the cost. Uh, and obviously, a lot of back and forth with the customer is, is, it, is, there, is it possible to reduce the cost a little bit? This is too expensive. And especially recently, with all, you know, with all the resin costs, labor costs, uh, we, we know you're seeing a rise. So uh, I thought I'd talk about a potential way to reduce the cost. So if you're dealing with the tank, um, using a dish top tank is always more cost effective than flat top. So if you don't really, really need a flat top, you can switch to that. Um, external pressure. So Jeff talked about this. The tank, the shape of the tank, it's perfect to take or contain internal pressure, but it's really bad at dealing with external pressure, especially the larger size of the tank. That's going to be, you know, the problem is going to be worse. So we, have, we see two things. One is the operating external pressure, let's say it's 0.1, but sometimes think, let's just be safe and design it for full vacuum. So why they don't understand is this is huge, huge cost difference. So some changes, they may, they may be just small cost difference, but some could be like you can't even imagine. Uh, and also if there is anything that you can do in your process, uh, to reduce the vacuum, let's say if you can have a larger vent, if it's as simple as that, do all those things to, to reduce the external pressure. Um, the other item is when you're dealing with especially the tall tank or, or liquids with high specific gravity, a seismic is going to govern, not, not pressure, not internal pressure or external pressure. It's going to be seismic. And one best way to deal with the seismic is to have a realistic operating liquid level. So the difference is uh, operating is based on the definition of RTP1, a liquid level that there is a very low probability that you exceed. That's basically operating. Most of the time you're operating at that. Design is opposite conditions. Sometimes forget to open a valve somewhere or close a valve and all of a sudden the tank is flooded. So we use the design, the worst case, the opposite condition to design everything pressure wise you know nozzles shell everything we design per your design operating liquid level but for seismic we use your operating so be realistic with your operating because again if you just say no design it all the way to the top while you're really operating at 30 percent you're paying a lot of extra money uh for extra thickness that you that you don't really need and again with larger tanks when you're dealing with 14 foot tank like 40 foot tall even 100 mil can mean thousands of dollars. You, you may think, oh, it's just 100 mil. It's not a big deal. But we're talking 1,000 now in that stage. So on the pipe side, again, if it's not a critical pipe, uh, using pre-engineered products, it's always more cost effective. It's going to be faster. Um, the other thing is if you can relax some of your requirements to be more aligned with the common industry standards. So... Uh, for instance, you have a safety factor of uh, 10 for a hand layer pipe, and it's not like super critical. It's just, uh, you know, uh, seawater being transferred through the pipe. Just consider comply simply with ASM and NM2 and lower the safety factor. Um, the other thing is uh, using the uh, vendor's mechanical properties. Sometimes we get a spec that are based on the properties in, let's say, ASM and NM3. Those are very conservative. They already have a lot of safety factors in them. Uh, and always ask for the proof of mechanical properties from your vendor, but using those results helps you. Um, the other thing is some vendors offer alternative type of joints, like adhesive joints, and those are more cost effective. Again, if you don't have any trust 
ask for test results, ask for proof that these type of joints can take, they're as good as butt joints, but you can consider those as well. Uh, maximize the assembly in the shop. What you do in the shop is higher quality and less expensive and uh, reduce the number of flanges. So if you don't really need flange, reducing flanges helps you with the cost and, and less headache down the road when you maintain the pipe. This one is really talking about the, you know, how we can reduce the cost on our side and transfer the saving to you. I, I trust that all the vendors, all the manufacturers, they try to reduce their waste. They're looking for ways to be more efficient. So it's gonna cost them less to make your product and transfer that saving to you and be more competitive. Uh, our biggest waste right now is uh, the waiting time, the idle time. And it always happens because uh, our customers are not responsive. So when we are set up for a uh, job, uh, it, it, it has implications. We focus our engineering on that job. We focus our drafting on that job. We switch mandrails. We, we shift our equipment around just to be set up to make that a specific uh, uh, component. And when we don't get the drawing back uh, in time and it's like a month delay, obviously we switch gear, we switch to different projects, but it's not like that. It, it takes time, right? Now, now we have to focus on that drawing to get it to the floor. Now we have to switch mandrel, we have to, you know, change equipment. And that's just time we're waiting. And that account for our biggest waste. So basically, you by being more responsive, uh, you're helping us to save money. But if we save money, eventually, we're going to transfer it to you. We have a certain percentage of profit margin, that's not going to change. So what other other saving on the base, uh, you're going to see that. So um, that's basically the, the main communication I wanted to uh, make with you. And uh, yeah, the other thing is, like I said, is you have a cer certain condition. And if a reputable vendor is confident something's working for you, uh, you can trust your vendor with their recommendation. Because again, the last thing we want to see is our product fail in your shop. Thank you for your time and is there any questions?